<laughs> there we go. All right. So uh, this is the, like I said, this is the first, uh, the episode one, I guess you could say, of our uh, Adulting 101 webinar series. Uh, this one is going to be all about financial wellness, specifically budgeting, relationships, and life events. And I'm going to introduce you now to our speaker, Andrea. So Andrea Robeo is a community outreach coordinator of Houston, Texas operations for the Foundation for Financial Education. That's the F3E <laughs> part of the acronym, uh, which is one of the largest and fastest growing 501c3 nonprofits in the country. Andrea graduated from the University at Albany and is a member of the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. She is an active member of the Houston Chamber, American Business Women's Association, and Autism Society. She was actually born in Bogota, Colombia, and is a native Spanish speaker. She likes to travel with her family and is an avid fitness geek and loves to try new restaurants. And she's here to talk with us about the different kinds of life life events and how that can impact um, our financial wellness. So Andrea, I'm going to let you take it away and I'm going to disappear for the time being, but I will be in the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. As Heather said, my name's Andrea and I'm with the Foundation for Financial Education or F3E for short. That's what we like to call it. Um, I've been in the financial field now for about eight years, and so I'm here to hopefully touch base on some uh, basic information and just share some wonderful resources that are useful for you guys. Um, the foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation whose entire purpose um, is to provide financial education and literacy so people can make better informed financial decisions about their finances in the future and their goals and their dreams. And so today's workshop is about budgeting, relationships, and life events. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so what is financial wellness? Oh, actually, let's get over the legal aspect of it. So just bear with me as I have to read it. Um, so before we begin, um, disclaimer, um, this is an educational workshop. It's presented by the Foundation for Financial Education volunteers, such as myself. We are not advocating or endorsing products, strategies, or any particular advice or recommendation about any particular investments or anything of that nature. The information provided that we're giving you today is a ve very general um, in nature. Each individual is responsible in doing their own due diligence for research and research any advice that I present to you today. With any financial advice, please keep in mind that there's no such thing as one size fits all. I strongly suggest you consult with a licensed advisor um, in your state or in your 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 yeah in your state where you can or where you reside uh, before taking any action related to the investments, insurance, tax, or any legal actions that you might want to have. Um, we are not affiliated with any companies or with any specific organizations, um, nor are we owned by any corporate entities. We are a standalone 501c3 uh, corporations whose sole purpose is to provide financial education. And with that boring part being said, let me move on to the financial wellness. Okay, so there's basically four parts to being financially well um, or having financial wellness in your or having wellness in your finances. The first question I would like to answer as a whole, and go ahead, if you have questions, Heather is monitoring the questions, go ahead and leave them as I um, as I go through this. Um, I would love for this to be a very classroom style interaction and presentation. Uh, but the first question is, what is financial wellness, right? So financial wellness is defined by many different people in many different ways 
And one of these definitions or the definition I'm going to go by is the process of learning and engaging in behaviors that are likely to result in the most optimum outcome. So I'll repeat that, the process of learning and engaging in behaviors that are likely to result in the most optimal outcome. Um, this definition is what I will focus on and what will represent or what will mainly focus on. Um, what you see on your screen right now is uh, behaviors that if you engage will likely result in optimal financial health for you and your family. So the first key is education, is are you informed about what you're hearing in uh, social media, in podcast, in TV, radio? Make sure that when somebody gives you an advice or they say, my cousin, my uncle, my so-and-so did this, that you don't follow through with that, that you do your due diligence and provide um, and do your education about that. The next part is financial stability. This essentially means what is your income? What is your output? And are you exceeding your income? So is your output exceeding your income? Our goal is for our um, expenses to never exceed our income because then that forms instability. That forms a large amount of debt and stress. Uh, now, short-term planning is, let's say you have some credit card debt at this time. Um, your short-term plan, it could be to pay that debt off. So you build a plan that maybe in four or six months, you will make this installment payments. And in that time period, you're now officially debt-free. That would be a short-term strategy. Long-term planning is a bit more advanced. This can include, obviously, retirement planning is the biggest one. When do you want to retire? What's the age you wish to retire? How can I get there based on my income, my situations, my responsibilities to people around? Um, and what can I do from insurances, from taxation, and from estate planning purposes? Those topics are considered your long-term um, planning and investments. Um, I see that we have some questions, Heather. Uh, should we answer that? Yeah, we have a question in the Q&A. What right. do you mean by output? Is that the amount of uh, how much we're paid or what we're spending? Um, sure. Great question. So income, obviously what your input is, is what I'm describing as what do you, what's your annual salary? And this is after tax, of course. So whatever your tax bracket might be, deduct that. What is your actual um, salary that comes into and gets delivered to your bank account? And then your output, what I like to say is what are your cost of living expenses? What is rent or how much is rent? Do you pay for the electricity, for your phone bill, for all the expenses that go around cost of living? That's what I'm calling output. Perfect. Okay. Let me continue. Okay. So we're going to start in this beautiful slide that people hate, <laughs> to be honest with you, which is budgeting. Budgeting is the most important thing and the biggest kind of chunk that I'll focus on. Uh, but then we'll move to saving for emergencies, for opportunities. Um, then we'll discuss how to reduce debt We'll go into retirement, uh, investing for retirement. I know you guys are really young and that's probably not something that you're thinking about right now, but it's never too early to start planning. And then finally, how to plan for some financial goals in the future. Okay, so let's jump in with, again, budgeting and creating a budget. Um, in my experience, what budgeting really means to a lot of people is avoid, like abort mission. We hate it. We don't want to do it. I have never, ever met a single person that loves to budget, that just loves to crunch numbers, that loves to plop that Excel sheet forward and say, let's get into it. They usually work and want to avoid it at all costs. They want to skip it. They want to get into the part where investing is fun. So a lot of the times when we meet with clients, 
um, they want to talk about the stock market. They want to talk about the S&P 500. They want to talk about the house they're going to buy or the rental property they're investing in. And then I'm like, hey, guys, we still have to go to step one, which is budgeting. How are we going to make these goals achievable? Because without a budget, these future goals are realistically never achievable because you don't have a plan set. Um, and I totally understand it. I understand it. Budgeting requires a level of restraint. It requires discipline. It's a little bit like exercise. I like to say um, when you start off, it sucks and it's you're sweaty and you're uncomfortable and you're red faced. Maybe you're just having a really bad time going through it. But then over time, it just becomes another habit, like brushing your teeth over time. It just becomes in your mind, without thinking about it, you go, okay, my budget for the week, my expenses for the week, I can go over $200 um, for my food this week. I'm just throwing out numbers here, but like $200 for food this week. So maybe groceries are $100 that I'll spend. Um, and then I have $100 for Starbucks or catching up with friends or going out to eat. And that's that's the that's the habit that slowly builds. And the more you do it, the more your brain doesn't really think about it. You just tend to do it. Um, budgeting is the most important habit that if you guys don't take anything else away, it is the thing that you need to do. It is the optimal financial, it's optimal for your financial health. Um, so please start budgeting today. And if you don't know where to start, if you don't know how to begin the whole budgeting process, um, I, the foundation can provide you with a budget worksheet. So essentially like an Excel sheet um, that has and breaks down all expenses in detail. So what's your rent um, or mortgage? Um, what do you pay for your phone? What do you pay for your gas? What is your um, expected um, car repair? budget what is I mean it goes into such level of great detail so at least you guys have a template to go by um, and you can skip anything that doesn't apply to you obviously um, but it's a very well uh, full of of all possibilities like expenses that we can all have and at least we can provide that for you so go ahead and leave a message to Heather or to me if you guys want us to send that to you because the foundation will more than happy provide that for you so at least to start off with your budget if it's too complex then just simply um you know delete the the columns or rows that don't apply and continue on um as well, um, I'm also going to pass out at the end or have Heather pass out um, our evaluation form where you can put your questions and concerns in that form as well, if you have any private questions or concerns. Um, now, the second thing that creates financial wellness is saving for emergencies or saving for opportunities. And I'm going to split them two up, right? So let's say you have to, have you ever had an appliance breakdown or an unexpected auto repair or perhaps a medical issue that requires for you to go to the ER. And um, at the ER, you found out that your deductible is not met yet. So now you have to pay for it all out of pocket. Um, how would you guys pay for this, for these unforeseeable future, for these unforeseeable expenses? Um, you know, is it, is it credit card? Is it installment payments? Like, what are you going to do if you don't have that ready cash, um, if you don't have that cash ready to go? And so that's where our budget comes in, because even though it's unforeseeable, you can plan for the unforeseeable. Um, one thing that I know about life is that it is unexpected to be alive is to expect the unexpected. And so hence, we know that life changes, life moves, there's life events, marriage, divorces, um, kids, we can plan for all those unexpected things that come our way. Um, and so I know I've been in a place in my life in my very early 20s where my tire popped and I it was about 250 maybe $300 to repair them. It was two tires that popped and I didn't have the cash available to pay for it. Um, and so I put it on a credit card and then later on what happened was that I paid $400 instead of the $250 to $300. 
because I was paying the for the tires plus the interest that the credit card was charging me. So that is something that credit cards don't necessarily make it cheaper to to live life, but it definitely makes it easier, I suppose. Um, now, now in my 30s, one of the great things that I do like to talk about, it's like saving for opportunities, right? So life is so unpredictable. And so what if a great deal comes around? What if your dream car, like the dealership for whatever reason, something goes on sale, or maybe it doesn't have to be a car, maybe it's a, a bag, I don't know, uh, anything that you want that you're like, wow, I really want that. Um, and you want to buy it and you don't have the cash available to buy this dream car, to buy the dream bag, to go on this dream trip with friends, whatever it may be, right? So it's saving for the opportunities for the future. It's potentially having money to invest in your own startup company, having um, the ability to have capital to maybe invest in a friend's uh, startup company. All of that is what I call saving for opportunities, um, which as you get older, the more it comes around, which is great. Okay. Um, I know through the foundation, I've spoken with hundreds of people over the years. Um, and essentially what I've gathered is the people that have a good sense of financial well-being or financial wellness um, have a lot in common characteristics. They have a budget. They have set up their goals, which are all um, my goal, financial goals and your financial goals are going to be completely different. So our goals are different, but they're set up. And then we, they have a plan and they stick to the plan. For many years in my early 20s, I would, if I had the motivation to even make a budget and create it, if I didn't hate the whole process of it, I never stuck through it. I never stuck to it. You know, I'd be like, oh, you know, this week I'll have $50 to spend with friends. And then I would go out and spend 80. And so you do have to stick to your plan. You do have to stick to what you promise. It's like a promise with your to yourself. You have to stick to that promise to yourself. Um, and in this plan, you always, always must include at the bare minimum, the emergency fund plan. So every month or every uh, biweekly, depending how you get paid, put money aside for that emergency fund. And then as your income increases because your career takes off, then you can create an opportunity fund as well on the side. Um, and just to just make sure that you have cash on hand for the unexpected. Andrea, there is a question that I guess kind of uh, uh, relates to this. Um, what type of budget are you able to create when you're living paycheck to paycheck? Oh, that is a tough one. Um, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, it is. So there's a few things that you can do when it comes to a budget. So if it is truly paycheck to paycheck and you've laid it out and it's in an Excel sheet and it's in black and white with numbers in front of you and it's like, yep, whatever's coming in is equally coming out. Um, it is a tough place. We've all been there. I've been there. Um, but the key thing is that people don't know is that you can negotiate certain, I don't know your situation. So I'm just going to throw out a couple of things. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do. You can call your phone company, your cell phone company, your internet company, and negotiate the rates with them. And they'll drop it because they want to keep your business. So if you say, you know, this is too expensive for me, this is not something I can afford at this time. The other person on the line is trained to keep you on as a client or as their client, essentially. And so they're willing to negotiate those, um, those rates. And so take that principle across every expense you have. Um, and then at that point, when it comes to budgeting, um, one of the things that I used when I was in college and I was living paycheck to paycheck, um, I never went out to eat. Food is really, really expensive. Um, and so unfortunately, I'm, I'm Hispanic. So fortunately, I love rice and beans. <laughs> so I lived off rice and beans for a very long time. Um, because it was really cheap and it was really affordable and it's what I could eat. I was also a waitress. So I ate at the restaurants a lot of the time um, for free. Um, and thankfully, I don't know if I would have made bills or could afford certain things um, if my food expenses were not taken care of by 
um, you know, the food, the, the company I was, the companies I was working for. Um, again, it's a really difficult place to be. Um, but if you just push through and get through with it, there is a potential for budgeting, meaning even if it's just a dollar, even if it's just 10, 15, whatever you can put aside, it's much better um, for you to do than nothing realistically. Um, because it gives you, I, I mean, I feel this way. You guys don't have to agree with it, but have been able to know that you can absorb a financial hit, whether that is a new car or new tires, um, a medical expense, whatever might come your way. If you're the feeling of being, of knowing mentally that we can absorb that and we're, we're not happy about it, but we're going to be okay. I feel like just lifts your spirit a little bit and it causes such an ease and you're able to have and live a bit more of a, a stress-free life. I would say, I know that's probably not the best of answers, but that's, that's the best I could do with the information. Okay. Um, now, like I was saying, we've all experienced those situations where we've had to put everything on credit cards, you know, that plastic card that we live by, that we've been trained by society to have um, for emergencies or for anything else, because it's the quickest, fastest way to solve the problem. And that's realistic. That's life. It's human. It's very normal. Um, the key is just to the best of your abilities to plan for the unexpected. Um a very common question that I get um, is how much should I have saved, right? So how much do I have saved? How, what is a good saving mark um, to, to save? And the answer knowingly depends on a lot of variables. It depends on your age. It depends on your income, on your responsibilities. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a very general rule of thumb to go by for most households, households, um, is to have anywhere between four to six months of income set aside in cash for the unexpected. I know that I, when I was told this in my 20s to have four to six months of income set aside, I was like, you're ridiculous. That is a ridiculous thing to say. Um, and for some people it is. For some people, maybe set aside is a month or um, a week. Just put a week aside that can pay for some expenses. For some people, they can set aside a month, two months, three months. I've met with people that prefer to have a full annual income ready to go just in case of something were to happen. So unknowingly, it really just depends on where you are in life. Um, as you get older, that budget becomes bigger. I feel like most people at a certain point, maybe at 25, 26, 27 and beyond, we start to see people save about three months worth of income. And then as they age, they have more, more savings uh, behind them. Um, so whatever you can save is better than nothing. I promise you that. It makes you feel better um, and maybe won't cover everything, but what you put on that credit card is not as not the whole expense, um, which, is, which, is, which is the benefit of it. Um, okay, now let's go down to reducing debt. And how do we do that? And what's the best way to do that? Um, like myself, I was a little or if you're anything like me, should I say I was a little and tad irresponsible in my in my very early 20s when I was in college. Um, and I had bad spending habits. I'm a spender. I am a spender. I'm not a saver. I am a spender. And so I developed habits to spend money really easily. Um, and so now let's talk about how to eliminate debt if you're in that position yourself. Um, but first, let's talk about what's good debt and bad debt, because there is such a thing as good debt. Um, good debt is anything like a mortgage. Um, mortgage is good debt. Yes, you have to pay off, pay it off. Um, and um all of us, most of us are not in a, in a privileged position to be able to afford a house uh, outright. So let's say the house is worth $200,000, uh, very few of us will be able to have $200,000 in cash to be able to buy that house. So most of us will have to take out a mortgage. You do have to pay it off. It's usually between 15 to 30 years. And depending on the interest rate and what you want, it can be fixed. It can, you can refinance. There's many aspects to it. But the great thing about a mortgage is that it can and is a tax, a tax deductible event. 
meaning when you file your taxes every single year, you're able to um, put that as a tax deductible event and it kind of saves you money on your taxes. Another thing that is equally in the same realm is student loans. Um, student loans have been in the news a lot in the several in several years, I would say, I think three years, there've been a lot of discussions about uh, the forgiveness part of it. And I don't want to touch too much on that because obviously our court system has ruled what it has ruled. Um, but student loans, when you start paying them off, um, it is also a tax deductible um, event, which means as you start paying it, it, sa it saves you on taxes. Um, and so every year you will file your tax return and you will put it on your taxes and it saves you tax money. So necessarily student loans is not a bad, um, a bad debt per se. Um, I do want to take a pause here. I know it's October. Um, and in this month, we have um, our student loans are, it's a life event happening this month where our student loans are the, the, the federal government wants their money back and their payments are starting up. So I just want to take a pause to see if you guys have any questions regarding the student loan payment programs that are happening right now. Um, how it applies if your student is still in school or if you're not in school or anything like that. Do you see anything, Heather? Not so far. We've had a lot of requests for the uh, budget spreadsheet, so we're going to have uh, <laughs> a lot of folks getting that. Um, so far, no no questions, though, about um, student loans, but if you guys do have them, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A, whichever you're more comfortable with. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, so now let's flip it and talk about bad debt and the debt that I was in, which was credit card debt. Um, and so why is it considered, or in the industry, why is it considered bad debt? Um, and the reason why is because it just dramatically drains your wealth due to the fact that with the interest alone, like there's no tax benefit to it. There's nothing. Usually the interest rates are sitting between 21 to 25 percent. That is absurd amount when you talk about um, when you talk about interest rates. That accumulation and that compound kills, and that's what I say. It dramatically drains your wealth insanely. Um, any personal loans. So I'm not speaking about home equity loans or anything like that. I'm actually just talking about um, stu personal loans that you take for yourself. Again, there's no tax deductible there, so there's absolutely no benefit to that debt. Um, and I really, before I, I bring up strategies on how to reduce your debt, I want to take a quick moment to talk about the companies that focus on eliminating debt. Just a word of caution here. These companies don't work for free. These companies are usually working in tandem with the credit card companies. Um, so the credit card company that gave you the credit card that now you're in debt with benefits because they're part company is also here and they are now um, working with whoever to get them debt free, right? So these companies just, if you're going to work with them, please do your due diligence, please vet them properly. Um, they take a fee and realistically, there's nothing that you can't do that they're doing. As the customer, you have all the power to call a credit card company to negotiate the terms and conditions. Um, the payment plans, the type of arrangement that you have, um, you as a person can call them all up and negotiate everything. So there's really no, I don't want to say that. In my opinion, there's no need for these companies yet. I'm not a credit card specialist. So just um, keep that in mind as companies, these companies are not, uh, are, are, don't work for free. Nobody does. Um Okay, so let's talk about one of my favorite methods to reduce yourself or uh, get out of debt, which is the snowball method. And this is essentially how it works. If you're in this place in life, um, just list out your debts based on smallest to largest, right? So don't include the interest rates, don't include anything additional, just go from smallest to largest. And then what you're going to do is, let's say you have four, let's say you have four debts and um, you're going to pay three, the bare minimum 
uh, or the minimum payment on three of them. And then for that very last small pay or small um, debt that you have, you're going to throw all your resources that you can into that um, into that bill. And then it's, that's why it's called the snowball effect. So as slowly and steady, you start building that way that you're able to pay that debt off. And then you just move to the next one, to the next one, and to the next one. I personally found this um, this method really great. You can Google it. It's actually a thing. Um, it is because it has a psychological part to it um, in a sense that we feel so good about and so accomplished and so proud of ourselves about removing ourselves from debt. So as we start paying off and as, start, as, as we start to really see the impact and the um, that our payments are having, we start to feel really good about ourselves. Um, and so again, go from smallest to largest and just continue on until everything's paid off. Um, hence why it's called the snowball effect. It gets easier as it goes downhill and you have more momentum going through you. And it honestly becomes a game over time. Um, so yeah, that is one strategy to go by. Um, the only caveat to this strategy, guys, though, is that please place those credit cards or the thing that got you into debt in a drawer, in a lockbox, cut them up, actually physically, whatever you need to do, just put them away. Um, because there's the basic of it is that you can't get out of debt if you are continuously putting yourself into debt, right? Um, there's just, there's, there's no winning here. You're not, you're not helping yourself out, should I say. Um, so the basics is don't go into debt. It, um, and so know your income, know your expenses and don't exceed your income essentially is what it is. Now there's other strategies that you can go into as far as debt payment. So if you want to have a conversation with me or with any of the volunteers in the foundation, um, you can reach out to Heather or reach out to me directly and we can schedule a 10 to 15 minute call. I suspect that maybe you guys have some questions here and there um, and we can, I can talk to you about how to get out of debt if that's your story. If not, then great for you because that was not my story in my 20s for sure. Um, now, I'm going to quickly just touch on retirement. I know you guys are a really young age at this time that you're not thinking about it, but it's a good it's a good time to start thinking about it. So maybe you can retire at in your 50s or in your 60s and not have to wait into your 70s or 80s um, to retire. Um, so, OK, the most common way to save for retirement is called qualified retirement plans. I don't know if any of you guys are employed and you guys are being offered any of these plans, but essentially they include 401ks, 403bs, um, TSPs, um, anything. These, these carriers or avenues, the, the pro to them or the good thing about them is that you put a portion of your income into them and the government cannot tax them. They cannot tax that amount that goes into that account. That's called a qualified retirement plan. The downside to it, guys, is that at the time of retirement, whether it's 50, 70, or 80, um, Uncle Sam's gonna come around and tax everything that's in that um, that that's in that um, account. Um, so just keep them in mind. Uh, keep that in mind. There are multiple ways to plan for retirement, whether that is for the 401k, whether that is creating a Roth, which most uh, companies do offer. You just simply have to ask about it. Um, and also most companies, if once you go seek employment and you start working, they usually also match some percentage. They don't have to, but if they do, the matching is anywhere between 3% to about I think the highest I've ever seen is about seven, eight percent. Um, so essentially they're giving you free money into that account. So that's that's a great benefit of it as well. It's sort of like getting paid a little bit more by your boss, which doesn't hurt. Um, and so again, when it comes to when should you start planning for it today, even now, just put in whatever it may be, I don't want to throw a number that's crazy, but let's just say $500. If you somehow have $500 that's just in a savings account, right? Create a fidelity or a well, like 
forgive me, just create anything that um, with a in financial institution and let's say a Roth and you can start putting it, putting it in there and then create that. And that naturally over time, it's the power of compound. And we hear people say, I want my money to work for me and not me work for my money. That's what they mean is that compound interest that that um, that that will have over time, especially if you guys are all in your 20s, by the time you access it in your 50s to 60s to 70s, um, that will accrue a lot of interest. And so it's a great strategy to even start now, even if you can only put in $500 to start off with, it's the time to start is now. And then as far as how much you put in, again, that depends on your age, your income and your responsibilities at this time. Um, and so I would say that that is a great, um, a great answer. Now let's move on to financial, to setting financial goals. So goals are so specific to the individual or to the family. Um, so is your goal saving for moving out for, um, your goal is saving and paying off your student loans. Um, maybe you're in a different position and you're saving for your wedding day. You're saving for a house. You're saving for your elderly parents' medical bills. All of this is a true, and it can be a true story, and it is a true story to somebody. So just start planning. Um, your goals need to have a road map. So your goal, a plan, set it and stick to it. Um, let's go to the next slide real quick. Do we have any questions while I go to the next one? We did have a question. Does the uh, foundation help out in terms of uh, process of application for federal loans? Um, yes, we actually can help. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, there was a question about uh, percentage in terms of putting in for retirement, but you basically said that was sort of a uh, depends on your income and your your input versus your output and all of that. Yeah. Correct. So it's yeah, just, it's it's one of those things that I hate being so cryptic, but I'm not. I don't want to give you a number and the people kind of stick by it. Um, the older we get, the tendency we have to put more into retirement. But um, since we're dealing with, uh, in my uh, belief, younger people, um, it's a great strategy just to put like $500 down to put um, maybe $20 here. And it doesn't sound like a lot, guys, but over time and over the power of the market and the stock market, I know what you hear in the news and it, the stock market is having having a bad time, but it always bounces back up. It always rebounds Um and so at some point we'll have a bull market again and that compound will pay off over time. Ooh, here's a good one. What is the difference between a 401k and a Roth IRA? Yeah, so a 401k, essentially the main reason or main difference is a 401k is, it's just a title. It just means in like the tax book, the 401k is just like the code of where it's in the tax code. But essentially what it means is that a company, your employer sets up a, a 401k for you. And they, and so now when you get paid every single or biweekly, you put a percentage of your income into that account, into that 401k account. Um, and you put it there every single month, you don't even miss it because you don't see it. It's automatic. That's an automatic transaction that goes into the account. Um, and so, but it's not tax. So you're not going to pay taxes on it, which is the great benefit of it. Um, but you will be taxed once you pull out from it. A Roth IRA, it's the opposite. It's kind of, it's the same thing. But the difference here is as you put money into it, you've already paid taxes on it. So when you take it out in 20, 30, 40 years, you're never going to uh, pay taxes on the principal. You might have to pay taxes on the um, any growth that the asset might have had, but you will never be double taxed on that principal or what you initially put in. That's what a principal is. It's like when you what you initially put in, you'll never be taxed on that again because you've already paid your taxes. So essentially as a 401k is you put money in for retirement, you ta you uh, get taxed when you retire. A Roth IRA, you put money into it and you get taxed 
the day or the year, the tax year that you put that money in there. Oh, I moved too quickly, but it's okay. Um, Heather, sorry, are we still here? I, I just saw Zoom do a shift and I don't know what happened. We are still here. Okay. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're on the relationship slide. Perfect. Okay. Um, so really quickly, let's go through the relationship aspect of it. Um, money is so connected to relationship, whether that is your parents, whether that's a spouse, a partner, whatever it may be. So, um, and sadly in America, when we do surveys for divorced couples and they take that survey, one of the main reasons or 36% of the time that they state find, um, as a re they, they state financial burden as a reason for the divorce. Um, which is sad. And so money can be a great thing, but it can also be a big stressor in the environment and in the life that you're in. Um, so when we see finance being a reason for divorce, it usually means that one person in that relationship felt that they were the sole uh, responsible one for the finances in the household, not just like contributing, like not saying like they are the breadwinners of the household, but they're the ones who are trying to manage and to save and to figure out what a 401k and a Roth IRA are. Um, they feel like all of the burden for future planning is on them. Um, and to avoid this, again, you might hate me for saying it, is to budget because hopefully when you get in a relationship, you'll come with a budget hopefully the other person arrives with the same kind of energy and arrives with a budget. Um, and you guys can now have the difficult conversation to have of how to merge these plans, how to make these plans um, be compatible with one another. How much debt do you have? How much, because um, it's a big thing now. Remember when you marry and somebody, you're inheriting their debt and their credit score. So just keep that in mind. So let's like, we need to have really uncomfortable conversations when we're dealing with money to avoid potentially being a reason for a separation down the future. Um, so yeah, just have, um, be comfortable with having uncomfortable conversations now. Um, so one of the things that I do want to hold on relationships and we move to the next slide before I start again. Okay. One of the things that, wait, no, that didn't work. Okay. One of the things I want to talk about now is life events. Um, and it could be job transitionings, um, promotions, getting fired, having kids, getting married, moving in together. Um, and these are big life event events that are happening. Uh, from if you guys are in school and you're taking out loans right now, none of your loans are due. But six months after your graduation date, um, they will be knocking for you to start your payment plans. And that is a life event. So it's time to start planning those life events as they come because they're fairly foreseeable in the sense that we're born, we go to school, some of us will get married, some of us will have kids, um, some of us will buy houses, we'll uh, take care of our children, our parents, X, Y, Z, and then all of us will pass away. Um, and so these very big life events, and I don't mean to sound morbid, but it's like these life events are very foreseeable and very, uh, we all expect it. We know what's kind of coming. Maybe, maybe two or three are negotiable, but apart from that, everything is pretty much set when it comes to life events. And so my biggest thing when it comes to relationship in life events is make sure the person that you marry or the person that you're with, whether you choose to get married or not, to have these conversations like, hey, do you want to have kids? I know that is a most ridiculous thing to even say, but I have met people that have gone through the whole part of courtship, gotten married, and then they realized that one person didn't want to have kids this whole time. Um, and at this point, parents are spending anywhere near $200,000 per child from the point of birth to the point of 18 years old. So as much as children are an absolute blessing, and I don't have any, but I've, I've heard that they're an absolute blessing, um, they're a huge financial burden. And if your parents and the both individuals are not ready for that financial burden, it can cause um, strain in the relationship later on. Um, so having conversations like that, having conversations as like, what debt do you have? Um, again, speaking because I've talked to hundreds of people is um, 
knowing that I had an um, individual come in who was a little upset because his significant other did not disclose that she had um, student debt and it was in the six figures. Um, and so he was really upset that now he had inherited or he had married that debt, uh, which is really upsetting. And so having uncomfortable conversations is key to your financial happiness in the future. Um, and being, and these are the conversations we need to have as far as like changing jobs, getting promotions, like I said, getting fired. And that is why we need budgets, guys. We need budgets and we need to go, like I said, marriage, children, divorce, long-term. Um, something I'm actually going to mention here really quickly that's going to sound a little bit crazy, but I think with our time period, it's, it's, a, it's a good advice in my opinion. Everybody here in this um, webinar or anybody should really discuss a prenups with their significant other um, if you're choosing to get married. And it doesn't really matter how much money you have, how much money you don't have. Um, it's sort of think about it like insurance. Um, it's just in case something bad happens, we're ready for the possibility. It's not planning for divorce. It's not planning not to stay together. There's no negative aspect to it. There's no malice intent into planning. It's sort of like when you have life insurance for your passing and you just wanna make sure your um, next of kin, whether that's your spouse, your kids, your parents are in a good financial setting, it's the same thing. You just want to make sure when a divorce does happen that in my experience, no one's at their best self when a divorce is occurring. So just making sure that all the requirements and everything's set out um, as far as like, this is what we're going to do. This is what we agreed upon. This is what you're going to get. This is what I'm going to get. It's really, really beneficial. Um, you should plan for not what people could do, but what they can do. Um, and when you have really high levels of emotions where marriage, children, and divorce are all of these things are involved, it's just always best to plan. Um, and then I know we're running out of time, but I want questions. Hold on, let me move forward. Um, okay. And so just, I'm going to quickly just wrap it up here, really, guys. Um, for the first steps, again, budget, budget, budget for... Um, your income and your expenses for emergency funds, for the opportunity funds, um, setting your set up for your retirement plan. Um, all of these things are essential for you guys to um, lead a more wellness financial planning. Um, and so just keep that in mind. And then on the last slide, I just want to point out there are great resources for you guys to have. The wwftc.gov website is gives it's a if you don't know your credit score, because maybe some of you guys don't know your credit score. Um, it's a great website. They give you a your credit report and score for free once a, um, annually, once once every year. The www.hud.gov um, is nothing to do with mortgages, mortgages or anything. It's just like housing knowledge for the urban areas. So it gives you um, great resources to when you're buying a house, because I know it's such a daunting life event, like your first home. So if anybody out there is in that situation, that is a great resource for you to use um, when you're starting your journey, because the better, the most, the more you know, the better um, you're off. Um, and then the other two, um, or for a law depot is just a free template um, for a will. I know nobody, we're, we're young and nobody's planning for it, but just in case. Um, and so also for the consumer.gov is again, budgeting and how to manage adulting. I think Heather, that's what you said, adulting or the, uh, the uh, adulting part of our lives. Um, and so with that, I do want to leave about five minutes for questions or anything that we can cover. Um, and so I just want to wrap it up real guys. Thank you so much for attending. I hope it was slightly beneficial or valuable. I know it's all over the place, but there's a lot of things we could go into. Um, and these hopefully resources are beneficial for your financial journey. Um, visit the websites. Um, my email, if anybody has specific questions is Andrea. That's A-N-D-R-E-A -E at F3E online.org. 
So that's F as in Fox, the number three, E as in elephant, online.org. Um, and so if you have any questions, go ahead and I guess you, Heather, you said they could unmute themselves or write down in the in the box below and I will try to answer them. Yeah, if you guys have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We do have a couple in the Q&A that are about um, 401ks. Okay. Um, one question was, can I roll over my 401k into a Roth IRA? Yes, yes, you can. Um, you can do that. Um, the only thing that I would say is just calculate it because it will be a tax event. Whatever year you do it, whether this year, next year, I don't know, when whatever that year happens that you roll over, you will pay taxes on that. So just make sure two things, in my opinion, make sure that you can absorb those taxes so you can pay them. And then number two, make sure that when that money gets rolled over on your taxes, it's going to show as income. So the last thing you want to do is bump your income into the next tax bracket. So just make sure that um, that doesn't happen. And if it does happen, just plan accordingly. You don't have to roll it over all at once. You can do small portions. Um, that's actually how most people do it uh, when they have large assets is they do small rollovers so they don't have to pay taxes all at once or they don't bump themselves to the next tax bracket. Okay. Another one is, um, is it ever a good idea to take money out of your 401k to pay off your mortgage? Oh, um, no, I'm going to say no. That's, I mean, uh, that's a hard one. My question would be like, why do we need to do that? What is the life event happening or the stress that's occurring? to make that happen. And if it's unavoidable, then of course we like, it can happen in that and, and we can plan or you can plan accordingly. But usually I don't see the, the great benefit of it unless there's something that maybe you can, I don't know, email me about and, and ask me in more detail. But I would say like for just like the, the the nature of just being broad and saying like for all it applies, I would say no, but there are specific circumstances that I would say yes to, but I just don't know if that applies to you. So I would, I would need more information. Okay. We also had a question in the chat. How can you budget when you're trying to start a small business? That's a great question. Um, mm. So with small, so here's the wonderful thing. I would say it's get organized. Um, one of the things is that have you set up, like, so you have to separate your accounts from your personal accounts to your business accounts, right? With that savings, that checking, credit cards, separate them both because that's beneficial. And then your company, whether you're setting it up by name or it actually has any assets or not, I don't know. But as you're starting to set it up, um, company needs capital. And so by, I would say by having that separation, it allows you to go to banks and, and ask for business loans, which that's a different topic that I didn't go through here, but I, we can, there is a full workshop on businesses or starting up businesses and how to do it and how to go about it. Um, but you can go into that helps you go into the banks, put, ask for a business loan and then start the process because there's tax benefits, um, not just for having the business, but there's also includes benefits for income tax when it comes to you because you can manipulate your income um, because now you're a business owners, a business owner. Um, so there is a lot of a lot of variables. I would say there we do actually have a budget for business owners as well. Um, so I can send that to you as well if you're if you're interested in that um, because it is it is a different animal to tackle for sure. Okay. Yes, I also put a link to the uh, small business. Um... U.S. Small Business Administration, they have a whole bunch of free learning. Um, it looks like they're, they're like short videos and whatnot trainings um, that can help you out and, you know, just get you, get you started on that, on that path. Um, we also have a question. Uh, 
someone who is still a sophomore in high school. Um, they also have a debit card. What kind of advice do you have for high schoolers who don't necessarily have a job yet? That's a fun time. Um... <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> And that's that's my advice, but we'll let we'll let Andrea, Andrea get the advice. <laughs> I would agree as well. Enjoy it; it's the best time. I know it doesn't feel like it, but it is truly the best time. Um, what advice would I have for? Oh, that's so fun! I honestly can't quite think of anything top of my head. Um, I love that whoever has a debit card because that's a great start, and we can practice. You know. Um, good spending habits. Um, but I, I personally would have to say, so the debit card, um, you can actually, I mean, you would have to have your parents' involvement into it as well. Um, uh, but you can start set up your own, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? I don't, without throwing a company out here, um, any kind of investment firm, you can, uh, use any investment firm that you'd like, um, and you can set up your own account and start playing with the stock market. I think that's a great experience and you can set it up. Obviously you have to have your parents consent to do so and they'll have access to it, but it's a great time to just get used to the finance world and get used to, um, you know, budgeting, playing around with money, because right now it's just fun. And that's why we've said, enjoy it. <laughs> it. It's fun to just play around with it. Okay, we've got one more question in the Q&A. Um, okay. What opportunities are there to consolidate bad spending? What kind of opportunities like debt, constantly, like, like if you have debt and you're just trying to combine it? I'm thinking that's what they're asking, um, like consolidation of of um, bad debts. Sure. So, I mean, there's multiple strategies. I, I just mentioned the snowball effect because it's or the snowball method because it's my favorite method to go by. Um, but there's multiple methods. Um, there are some times that it, it depends and it depends. Like you have to be strict with all of these that I'm mentioning. You have to be strict with them. Um, you can set up a apply for a new credit card, which most credit cards give you 0% uh, for the first 12 months and use that credit card to absorb all the debt that you've had from multiple cards and start aggressively paying that card off until that interest rate kicks off 12 months later. Um, again, that Im involves cutting every single credit card that you have. You cannot use them. This is just about paying them off. Um, so I would say that, or if you have a house, um, and you have a mortgage and you have an equity line, it wouldn't be a bad idea, but again, please research and do your due diligence with it to use your home equity to absorb some of that debt because mortgage, uh, rates are much more favorable than credit card debts rates. Okay, and I believe that's all the questions we've got. So I'm going to pop back on here and get my video to pop up. Ah, there we go. It's because I have you spotlighted. There we go. So thank you again, Andrea, for the uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. So um, I'm going to ask uh, a, a big ask of you guys. I'm going to put, post a link for a survey in the chat. If you would fill this survey out and give us some feedback, I would absolutely love it. But because I am determined, if uh, you cannot click that link right now because you're running off somewhere else, you're also going to get an email that says, thank you for attending, and the link will be in there as well, so you can also do it from there. But if you would do it right now but while you're thinking about it, that would be wonderful for me. So thank you again, Andrea. Um, I'm going to put sure. the uh, address again for uh, F3E online. I keep trying to say F3E. FE3, but no, it's F3E <laughs> online. <laughs> and there is a resources page that they have on there that is fantastic. I was going through that while um, uh, everyone was asking questions like, ooh, can I can I throw some some 
uh, links at folks and everything. So, but yes, um, this uh, webinar was recorded. We are going to see about getting that up for you guys um, fairly soon, sometime during the the semester. Um, in the meantime, please fill out the survey. And uh, if you have attended and you are here right now, you've been here for the whole thing, you should be getting a uh, certificate in your email in a few days. Um, I have to do them by hand, so <laughs> it'll take me a little bit. Oh, how do we retire if we have a personal business? Uh, mm -hmm. That that might be, uh, oh, uh, I have a personal question. Oh, uh, that might be a question for you to email to Andrea and ask ah. about, because <laughs> it's going to depend on your business, right? Exactly. So I would say email me or call me. Um, I don't know if you have our, it's an office line, so they can call and they can ask for me and I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, it's 281-972-8388 or email me for any questions um, due to the fact that I am a volunteer, just wanted to put it out here. None of your calls or visits with us will ever cost anything because we are a nonprofit. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, just let me know. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Andrea. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call the webinar here so I can honor everyone's time. Thank you again for everyone for uh, um, attending and keep an eye on your inbox for your certificate. And if you do not get one, feel free to uh, email me and ask where the heck it is because <laughs> I may need to be, I may need to be poked. But all right, and I will make sure to send out that budget sheet to everyone who requested it. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you again, Andrea. Thank you.